Good morning, everyone. How's everyone today? Good, good. Awesome. Glad to hear it. Thanks for being here. Glad that you could join us for Bible study this morning. Let's uh, begin our study with a prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, send your spirit uh, to these, your faithful people. Help us to focus our attention on your word to gain an appreciation for the love that you shower into our lives. Help us to apply these truths into our lives that we might be better suited to serve you and others. Uh, Lord, we thank you for uh, the Christian family that you have made us to be, and, uh, and we ask that you send your blessing on this gathering today. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Our Enduring Faith series continues this morning. Uh, we've been lining up our adult Bible class schedule with the Sunday school schedule in hopes that um, you'll know what your kids are learning in Sunday school, those of you that are parents, um, and have an opportunity to do dis some discussion. Um, of course, uh, we're hoping that adults can have discussion at home as well as we ponder some of these truths so today we are looking at the land at last. So we're going to focus on the story of Joshua. Joshua taking over uh, the reins of being the, the leader of God's people and, and taking them finally into the promised land. I'd like to give you just a few moments, uh, a minute or two, to at your table discuss the impact that promises have on a relationship. The impact that promises themselves and then what you do with those promises, how does that impact uh, a relationship? And pick any relationship you want or speak in general. It's your discussion time. You do with it as you please. Promises. What impact do promises have on relationships? Who'd like to start? Makes me a little nervous. There's a table in the back of people I've made a lot of promises to. I don't know if I want to give a microphone to, to the table back there. But how do promises impact a relationship? Linda. Okay. Sure. Reputation linked very tightly to promises and how good you are at fulfilling 
promises, right? We are living in a world where that is happening on TV, we're in an election cycle, right? That's the goal is the opponent tells the other, they don't keep their promises, right? They said this and, and look at what they've done or haven't done. Um, so yes, definitely your reputation, how others are going to think of you in general, your relationship with the public, and then even more specifically in one-on-one -on -one relationships, right? Who else? Has some thoughts, uh, uh, Trisha? <laughs> okay, trust. Trust happens when when promises are kept, right? And if you if your reputation is breaking promises or your word, you say things and you toss them out there and you have no intention of keeping, eventually people aren't going to listen to you, right? Um, Every parent tells their child about the boy who cried wolf. That's about uh, similar, right? That's reputation and, uh, and being honest. Anyone else comments about promises? All right. Let's take a look then. We are going to be in Joshua chapter 3. And then also Joshua chapter 4. How long did it take God to keep that promise? The promised land was first promised to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. God promised Abraham that he would have some land as Abraham finally made his way into the land of Israel. Um, that promise is restated. Abraham buys a small portion of that land to bury his wife, and then continues traveling along. But it's not until Joshua chapter 3 that a descendant of Abraham actually enters the land with the intention of making it their own. So just by, by means of having a little bit of a, of a chronology here. So Abram is 75 years old when God speaks that promise, come leave your land. Um, two sun, a few Sundays ago, Last time I taught was the lesson on Abram. We got to look at all of this. So Abram waited 25 years for his son, his one son to be born, uh, even though God had promised to make him a great nation. I actually used this in a sermon um, a few months back, how long 25 years is and, and how patient Abraham must have been uh, in waiting for that promise. But technically, Abram waited for longer than that. There's 60 years then from the time that Isaac was born to the time that Jacob and Esau are born. So that generation, uh, there's a 60-year span. There's 130 additional years from Jacob's birth till the time that Jacob enters into Egypt. Um, you got a chance to look at the Joseph story last time. Um, Joseph sends the, uh, his brothers back and they bring father Jacob with them from Canaan back down to Egypt. There's 430 years of Egyptian captivity. Uh, we're told in Exodus chapter 12 it was 430 years to the day. Um, and then there's 40 years worth of wandering uh, in the desert. So if we add all those, I'll save you from doing the math, 685 years from that promise first being spoken by God to its fulfillment. So if you thought 25 years was a long time, 685 years is uh, quite a bit longer. Um, that's how long it takes God to make good on this promise to give his people a land. All right, that's the story that's before us today. Let's take a look. Joshua chapter 3. We'll start by looking at the first four verses. You can follow along with your Bibles, with your Bible apps. You can listen really, really closely as I read them. Up to you. Early in the morning, Joshua and all the Israelites set out from Shittim and went to the Jordan, where they camped before crossing over. After three days, the officers went throughout the camp, giving orders to the people, when you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God and the Levitical priests carrying it, you are to move out from your positions and follow it. Then you will know which way to go, since you have never been this way before. But keep a distance of about 2,000 cubits between you and the ark. Do not go near it. OK. 
Okay. Shatim to the Jordan River was only a few miles. Why the short trip? Oh, that's way too small. Let's zoom in. Um, this is the, the map of them wandering through the wilderness. That's a little better. You can see as they finish their wandering, they make their way through Edom, is to the southeast of the, the Dead Sea, and then Moab more due east of the Dead Sea. And then they get here. Abel Shatim is what the, the city is called here on this map. And you can see just a, a couple of miles, a few miles is all it takes. They break camp, they go two miles, and then there they are at the banks of the Jordan River. So this becomes kind of a peculiar thing, what's going on there. Incidentally, on that map, you can see the, the triangle there marking Mount Nebo. Mount Nebo, if you recall, is where Moses is buried by the hand of God. Um, Moses, because of uh, some of the sins that he committed in the wilderness while he was leading God's people, is told that he won't be able to enter the promised land. Uh, but God gives him the privilege of being able to see it. And so he allows him to climb this mountain here and, and view over the Jordan River into this is the land that God had promised to his ancestors. Then Moses dies and God buries him there. So that sets the scene for Joshua taking over. That's Joshua chapter 1. Um, Joshua chapter 2 sends the spies, the two spies, across and they encounter Rahab. They get shelter and then protection from Rahab. And as a result, um, when the pending destruction of Jericho comes, Rahab and her family are spared. So you can see all of that geography here uh, zoomed in. But I'd like to ask the question, why? Why such a short trip? Shatim to the Jordan River is only a few miles. Why such a short trip? And maybe more importantly, why camp at the Jordan for three days? You ever thought of that? Maybe that's a detail that's maybe escaped you um, as you've read this story. But they, they, they march for whatever it takes, an hour, to get from Shatim to the Jordan River, and then there they sit and they wait for three days. They could have gotten up, they could have slept in, taken a lazy morning, walked over to the Jordan, walked through, and, and been to, to Jericho. Uh, Gilgal is actually where they camp the night after these amazing events. Could have done that easily in an afternoon. Instead, God makes it take three days. What's going on? Why? You're going to make me tell you? No. Uh, Lori? All right. Okay, chance to reflect, a chance to pray, a chance to have some perspective on what's about to happen. Okay. Gloria. Okay, here they have this opportunity. They're told, follow the, the ark when it goes, and, and that's, that's where it went. They, they were given this, this one final test. Uh, they had been wandering through the desert for 40 years, right, following the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire. Um, now they're given this commandment when the, when the ark leaves, you, you follow it. And, and the ark, when the ark makes a small trip, that's what your trip will be too. Yes? It depends. That's a really good question. What does... Yeah, what does the Jordan River look like at this time? That's a really good question. So, the Jordan River is at flood stage. We're told that this happens in the spring. That's a detail that comes a little bit later. Um, so, flood stage, probably about 100 um, yards wide. Um, maybe 10 feet deep at flood stage. An interesting thing about <clears throat> the Jordan River, the water is pretty clear when it leaves the Sea of Galilee, um, but by the time it makes its way almost to the Dead Sea, it's picked up so much silt that you can't see through it at all. It's dark and it's heavy. Um, I was reading, as the crow flies to get from 
the Sea of Galilee to the Dead Sea, I believe, if my numbers are, if my memory is serving, is about 70 miles. If you hopped in a canoe and went down the Jordan River, you will have logged 200 miles on the Jordan River. Now, the maps we see, it kind of, you draw a straight line, but it actually is zigzagging its way all the way through that elevation change, all the way down into the Red Sea. So um, as a result of that, you end up with some rapids, you end up with uh, some zigzagging uh, currents, um, which I believe God bring one of the answers to this question, bring the people to the shore so that they can see this. Um, we are told that the spies, they crossed the river um, to go into Jericho and then swam back to get back into the camp. So it's possible to do, but um, I don't think... I think what happens with two people is an awful lot easier than the two million that most believe uh, this group to be at this time. So I think part of the reason is that God wants the people there to see, uh-oh, <laughs> what's going to happen here? How is this going to how is this going to play out? Anyone else with thoughts about three days? God tells them that something incredible is going to happen, and so they get a, an opportunity to trust here. Um, I hope no one, we don't hear of anyone who waited for a day and then gave up and went back into the desert. Um, it seems like they were all on the same page and were all um, anticipating waiting for, for the Lord and for his timing. Um, we see something similar a few days later as they conquer Jericho. Remember, they march around the city, blowing their trumpets, and then they go home. And then the next day they do that again, and then they go home. And then six days in a row they do that. And then on the seventh day they do that seven times. So God is, is instilling in them this idea that he's the one that's in control and it's on his timing. I'm going to ask you a question a little bit in two questions here that sort of dovetails with this one. So I'm going to move on to the next one for now. Uh, when you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God and the Levitical priest carrying it, you are to move out from your positions and follow it. Then you will know which way to go since you have never been this way before. List some reasons why this is not only a command but also great advice. Make some applications for your own life. Why would this be a wise thing for the the Israelites to do. Besides, God said to, and it's always good to do the things that God says to. Well, it's a, it's a picture language of God leading, and we are to follow God's lead. And it does answer, it seems so obvious, but if God says it's time to go, and get behind me, I will lead you throughout the rest of your lives as your people, as his people. So that's, I, I see that as a visual sign. Okay, to fall in line and lead where God, God leads, even when it doesn't make sense, right? Uh, a a one-hour trip, and now we're, now we're out of our camps, but now we wait. We're walking right to the edge of a river, and there's nothing we can do about this. But God's got his plan, and, he's, and God encourages his people to follow. Trish? Yeah, is God in direct dialogue with these priests to show them, here's where I want you to stand, here's where I want you to go? Um, somehow they knew what to do. They knew carrying the ark, they knew how to get, uh, how to break camp and, and when to. So yes, they were, somehow God was revealing his will to them. Um, in this account, he starts directly speaking to them, so it would be a decent assumption that he probably is is giving some instructions on the side to them all along. Linda. It's like a rite of passage. There's no turning back after you've crossed this river. Okay. Going there, I'm guiding you. And, and all the lessons they have learned in the 685 years as children of Israel, that this graduation, that you know, now you finally, this is the end of that training period, and now you're moving on. Yeah, so um, 
the last uh, of this, or at least in this period in history, where God is directly, physically going in front of them, right? Uh, it was pillar of cloud by day and pillar of fire by night, wandering their way through the desert. Here it's the Ark of the Covenant that's going to lead them. Uh, once they get across the river, now it's going to be Joshua is commanding the armies. The Ark is going to find its home at Shiloh, and then eventually when they take the city over, Jerusalem, for a tabernacle's final place and then the building of the temple. So God's presence is going to dwell there, not so much like I can just fall in line behind the Ark of the Covenant and he'll show me where to go and where to plant crops and, and which enemies to... You know, it won't be that direct leading anymore, but now God is transitioning into uh, being led by Joshua. And there's even a reference in this section um, that, that tells Joshua and assures him through this event, through this powerful miracle, I'm going to glorify your name as the leader of, of God's people uh, and glorify my own. Please. Okay. So, kind of that physical separation yet? Sure. And I'm getting at that with the next question. Uh, so thank you for the good segue. What do you make of the distance between the ark and the people? God, God says, come and follow, but you got to have some distance. What do you think? Please. Right. So the whole river dried up all the way to the Dead Sea, so they needed all that space to almost all that space to move to still keep the distance between the ark, like God says. Okay. Yeah. So that's interesting that you bring that up. Later on, the ark is told the priests stop in the middle of the river, and the people are told, now not follow, but go past. And, and, and I don't know that we're for sure told, do they have to then bow around and keep that distance? Or is this now God's command is now to take over and, and go past? And, I think they kept distance. Yeah, it's, it's possible. I would have, right? How cool is that? <laughs> yeah. Um, we know from the rest of the history of the ark that there's the command given that no one can touch it or they will die. Right. Right. And we, and we know that. So, uh, But did, did they have to have this half a mile, 2,000 cubit distance, or is the command now past the ark a waving of that so that we don't know. We're not sure. Where else in scripture is there this, this picture of, of this distance? Maybe in the tabernacle? Okay. The curtain dividing. Yep, the holy place and then the most holy place or the holy of holies. Uh, that's where only the high priest could go in and only once a year because there has to be separation between sinners and God, right? We get the picture then in, in the temple uh, as that curtain is torn in two on Good Friday, that Jesus' sacrifice now cleanses us and bridges that gap, and now we can go and be in God's presence. Okay, other places where there's this separation between sinners and their God? Josh? Josh? Okay, sinners can't, can't have a dwelling with God, and so those that aren't forgiven and washed clean by Jesus end up eternally separated from God. Okay, there's a bit of this in Moses in the burning bush. He's told, 
you're on holy ground, take off your sandals. Uh, there's a posture that has to change. Um, Isaiah's got this in mind as, uh, uh, as he's commissioned and says, woe is me, I'm a man of unclean lips, uh, and I serve a people of unclean lips, and I have seen the Lord God Almighty. Um, so this, this separation, this, people were, were keenly aware, and this was built into the theology and into the practice of the Old Testament, that there is separation um, between God and people, separation between God and sinners specifically. Okay. Here's the comparison to the Red Sea parting. Joshua 5, verse 23 references a similar miracle. Compare and contrast the setting, rationale, reaction of God's people and his enemies, and anything else you'd like between this event and the event recorded in Exodus chapter 13 and verse 17 and following. Take two or three minutes at your table if you'd like to peruse, um, read ahead in this section, read a little bit of, of Exodus 13 to put that story back in your head, um, or else just speak in, in terms from your memory. Um, take that time, go ahead and discuss at your tables. What that verse is supposed to say. 4 verse 23 is probably... Yeah, the wrap up to this, it's 4 verse 23. Thank you. Sorry about breaking a promise.
Take 30 more seconds. Compare those scenes, the scenes at the, the start of the parting of the Red Sea to the scene here, the beginning of the crossing of the Jordan River. What comparisons, what contrasts were you able to find? Okay, miraculous deeds that could only be done by God. A comparison of the two events. Joanne? They were exiting, right? <laughs> Exit versus entrance. That's a, a key difference. Yeah. Okay. God used, yeah, there is providence involved in both, although a different style, for sure. The Israelites may have learned a lesson or two from leaving Egypt. Why did you bring us out here to die? Okay. Yeah, they, they were led, if you remember the Red Sea story, they were led and they knew that Pharaoh's army was pursuing them and then they got to the edge of the water and they thought they were done, right? <clears throat> and then they, they grumbled and complained and, um, and then God, despite that in grace, opens the waters and, and shows them a deliverance. Again, God was in control even though they couldn't see it, right? The enemy pursuing... It's kind of interesting, the context of this, if you read the chapters surrounding um, the enemies of, of God's people were not, pursuing, were not pursuing the Israelites at this point. In fact, we're told that they were filled with fear. This two million strong group of people, many of them fighting men, uh, were making their way through not just the places where they were going, but also word was spreading and these neighboring nations were, were learning and fearful about what was happening, and they had heard the story of the Red Sea parting for them to come, and, and certainly uh, those Canaanite kings and, and nations would hear uh, this story too, that, that this is a God who has power over nature. So rather than a, an army pursuing them, it's actually in fear. The, the Canaanites are hoping that the waters stay closed to keep the people out. Um, so you've got this... this ant hopeful anticipation as they're about to enter the promised land versus their fearful, uh, many of them wanting to go back. Maybe we could go back to slavery again. So you see the, these differences uh, in the mindset, in the, the, the settings, in, in the, the way that the people around, the others, the enemies, uh, re responded. Um, two very, very similar events, uh, but yet context shows how, how and why things would be different. Okay, let's read verses 7 and 8 of chapter 3. And the Lord said to Joshua, Today I will begin to exalt you in the eyes of all Israel, so that they may know that I am with you as I was with Moses. Tell the priests who carry the Ark of the Covenant, when you reach the edge of the Jordan's waters, go and stand in the river. So a couple things you see happening here. Um, one is... God's transitioning here. Now God is using Joshua to be the spokesperson. Um, go tell the priests, here's what they're supposed to do. Um, God comes out and says it. I will exalt you, Joshua, in the process. You're going to be the leader. 
uh, and, and you're going to be the one that these people look to. So you can see how um, God was preparing the people and getting them ready for this new leadership, not just from, from Moses to Joshua, but Joshua was going to be the commander who would lead armies, right? Um, so, uh, but God would still be in control and God would still be with them. Uh, you can see God setting the stage for that. Go stand in the waters. Does God ever ask the same of you, and how is that possible? Remember flood stage, wide river, probably some currents moving this way and that, and then God tells the priest, go stand in that. Go stand in those, in those turbulent waters. Has God ever asked that of you? I'll tell you, he does. Okay, so <laughs> how is it that you can follow? How is it that you can stand? Okay, we've got faith that God has given us. Faith that does what? Trish. Okay, faith that sees the promises of God. Okay, what else? Cindy. I will be with the presence of God makes it possible for us to stand in the waters. No matter how turbulent they are, no matter how silly it seems to go out and stand uh, and, and be there in danger, um, when God leads us, we can follow. Uh, when God speaks, we can trust in his word and, and in his promises. Okay, 9 to 17. Joshua said to the Israelites, Come here and listen to the words of the Lord your God. This is how you will know that the living God is among you, that he will certainly drive out before you the Canaanites, Hittites, Hivites, Perizzites, Girgashites, Amorites, and Jebusites. See the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth and will go into the Jordan ahead of you. Now then, choose twelve men from the tribes of Israel, one from each tribe. As soon as the priests who carry the ark of the Lord... The Lord of all the earth set foot in the Jordan. Its waters flowing downstream will be cut off and stand up in a heap. So when the people broke camp to cross the Jordan, the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant went ahead of them. Now the Jordan is at flood stage all during the harvest. Yet as soon as the priests who carried the Ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water's edge, the waters from upstream stopped flowing. It piled up in a heap a great distance away at the town called Adam in the vicinity of Zarethan, while the water flowing down to the Sea of Araba was completely cut off. So the people crossed over opposite of Jericho. The priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stopped in the middle of the Jordan and stood on dry ground while all Israel passed by until the whole nation had completed the crossing on dry ground. This is how you will know that the living God is among you. How is this a sentence that can be spoken by any Christian? And how is it so different than what a non-Christian says about their gods? Or I suppose you could add, the atheist says about life. How is this sentence so much different and so much better? Josh. Okay. We have God who is active in our lives for our benefit. Uh, versus other gods who aren't doing that at all. You could say that the main difference between Christianity and any other, other religion, Christianity is a religion where God comes to us. 
Every other religion requires us to do something to come to God, right? To be obedient or, or to get into the right frame of mind or whatever, fill in the blank. You do the things so that you can come to God. Christianity is the only religion where God comes to us and dwells among us. And so here these words that are spoken are, are so fitting. This is how you will know that the living God is among you. The living God that was among the people of Israel in this time is the living God who is among us, living and active and loving. That's our God, and his presence is all we need. His comfort um, is, is what we need to, to pass through the rivers and turbulent waters of life. Um, his presence is what is our life. Why could the priest stop in the middle of the river? We're running out of time, so I'll just tell you what I'm getting at with this one. Um, they stop right there in the middle of the river, the middle of the danger zone, right? Picture like a family that's on a hiking trip and, and there's a branch across the, the, the path and, and the dad pulls that branch back and says, all right, go. The kid, no kid would just stand right there where, where the branch could snap and just wait. They'd, they'd scurry through the danger to safety on the other side, right? But we don't see the priests and the Ark of the Covenant doing that. They stand there right in the most dangerous place to be, right in the middle uh, of where, humanly speaking, it would seem that those waters could come crashing in at any moment. But they can stand there. God's people don't have to sprint across because he's in control. Uh, God's people can stand there in the danger. They can take their time they can pro process in an orderly fashion because God's got them and God's got this situation in their hands. And so when we in life feel like we're in the danger zone, when, we're, when we feel like we're in the worst possible place or taking the brunt of temptation or trial or hardship, uh, we can know that even there, even in the middle of the river, we've got our God and his presence and his promises and his love. Here's a zoomed in map of, of this river valley. The gray area uh, would be where, where the, the ground goes down the valley into the river. Um, and then you see up at the top, it's 20 miles upstream is the town of Adam where we're told the water piled up in a heap. In fact, that's the same Hebrew word that's used to talk about the Red Sea, the, the walls of water. Uh, it's the same picture, the same thing happening. So you've got this dam uh, and, and a, a little temporary lake is being formed as God gives the people the time that they need. And then the water finishes flowing into the Dead Sea, so you've got a 40-mile stretch, which, uh, as we said before, allows them to fan out a little bit as they, as they cross the river. Um, Gilgal is that town over there next to Jericho. That's where uh, they make their next camp. Uh, we're going to talk about the memorial stones. Uh, the instruction is given for them to be taken from the river. They're set up into the memorial there in the city of Gilgal. All right, let's do verses 1 through 7 of chapter 4. When the whole nation had finished crossing the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, Choose twelve men from among the people, one from each tribe, and tell them to take up twelve stones from the middle of the Jordan from right where the priests are standing, and carry them over with you and put them down at the place where you stay tonight. So Joshua called together the 12 men he had appointed from the Israelites, one from each tribe, and said to them, go over, go over before the ark of the Lord your God into the middle of the Jordan. Each of you is to take up a stone on his shoulders according to the number of the tribes of Israel to serve as a sign among you in the future when your children ask, what do these stones mean? Tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. When it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. These stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. Significance for their past, their present, their future. They can worship their God who opened the Red Sea, who preserved them through the wilderness, who now is making good on his promise. Um, in the present, it's an act of worship for what the deliverance that their God has given them. And then, of course, future generations given the opportunity to see those stones and either know what they meant or, or like we're told here, when children ask, what do these stones mean? An opportunity to share of the, 
the grace and power of God. What are some ways you can set memorial stones in your life? I'll leave you to ponder that. Um, Maybe celebrate spiritual milestones of baptism day. Put it into your Google calendar um, so you can observe it and thank God for it. Your confirmation day. Um, Thank God for his grace and mercy in your life. And then that last question I'm, I'm going to leave for you to do at home. That was kind of an application wrap-up question anyways, so that works well. That could be one you discuss with your family, your spouse, over lunch, um, as you continue meditating on God's word. So, I didn't want to teach a whole lesson without talking about the promised land of heaven, since that's kind of a part of this as well. Here's a passage from Hebrews chapter 11. All these people, this is the Hall of Faith chapter, All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. They were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Just as God promised his people a place where they could dwell, a place that would be their own, our God has made that promise to us. He's promised us a place, a city with foundations, uh, a place in heaven. And so we can rejoice that our God is faithful to his promises and and that he has given us uh, an everlasting relationship with him. All right, for our closing song, we're going to sing two stanzas of Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah. Guide me, O thou great Jehovah, pilgrim through this barren land. I am weak, but thou art mighty. Hold me with thy powerful hand. Bread of heaven, bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. Feed me till I want no more. When I tread the verge of Jordan, bid my anxious fears subside. Death of death and hell's destruction, land me safe on Canaan's side. Songs of praises, songs of praises, I will ever give to thee, I will ever give to thee. Thank you for being here today. God's blessings to you on your week.